Welcome everybody. We're really thrilled you're joining us for our next in our series of Brown Bags in Science. Today we're super excited to have Dr. Joe Ciccola with us. Um, Joe is an assistant professor of applied exercise physiology in the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences at Teachers College, Columbia University. He has degrees in exercise physiology and exercise psychology with additional training in behavioral medicine. Dr. Chicola's laboratory, the Resistance Exercise Health and Behavior Lab, or Rehab Lab, focuses on the use of resistance training as a potential treatment tool for managing substance use disorder and mental illness. Over the past 10 years, Dr. Chicola has received approximately 2.5 million in private and federal funding for his projects, and he has published more than 50 peer-reviewed papers on his work. So we're really excited to have Joe with us today. What we're gonna do is turn it over to Joe. He's gonna have about 25 minutes or so to go through his presentation. If you have questions, um, go ahead and type those into the question box and we will take all questions at the end. We've allotted plenty of time for that. So with that, welcome everyone and we'll turn it over to Joe. Okay, thank you, Lynette. Uh, thanks everyone for joining me today. So as you can see, the title of my talk is Resistance Exercise to Treat Substance Use Disorder, Potential Mechanisms and Benefits. And so uh, my plan for this is to first just go over some of the significance of this uh, of substance use disorder and what it, how it's related to chronic disease and illness uh, and the phases of addiction that people experience. Uh, a small pilot study that we did with uh, heavy alcohol drinkers, uh, young adults, and then a much bigger study that we did with cigarette smokers, uh, of which the majority of research on exercise and addiction has really been done with smoking. Um, and so I uh, hopefully will be able to add to that literature with this study that we recently um, completed. And I'll talk a little bit about the future directions of this research and where I think this area is going. So just to give you some background, take a step back, a bigger picture, uh, the causes of death, uh, the latest statistics from 2016, uh, we see listed here. And probably no surprises, as you see heart disease, number one, cancer, number two. Uh, and then the usual suspects that are there, stroke and diabetes. Um, I just want to call your attention down to the very bottom there, number 10, suicide, which is clearly related to uh, mental illness. And we know that you know, addiction is a mental illness. It's comorbid. Uh, addiction is comorbid with mental illness, often occurring with anxiety and, and depression. And so um, clearly there's a significance here that goes along with this problem. Uh, uh, Looking at risk factors, this is a, a graphic from the Journal of the American Medical Association that came out recently. Uh, and, and on the left side there, you see the different risk factors and then they're associated with the different diseases that are on the right. So it's a little bit small, I know it's hard to see, but basically it lines up with the slide that I just showed of heart disease and cancer, et cetera. And I just wanted to pull this in a little bit closer. So if you see the risk factors, if we look at number two and then number eight, we see that tobacco use and alcohol and drug use are listed there. So these are major problems that we need to deal with. Uh, they cause a significant amount of morbidity and mortality in our society, and it's been going on for a while. If you look at this slide, this is again from JAMA from a couple of years ago. Uh, over the past 34 years, uh, if you look at the bottom of the slide there, it's, this shows the mental and substance use deaths for every 100,000 people and how this has grown. So this is uh, has been and continues to be a more significant problem. So with respect to um, something that needs to be addressed and how we need to address and how we can use exercise to address this problem is really an issue that I've been concerned about. To give you some background on understanding substance dependence, there's basically three different phases. And so you have phase one, which is really the acquisition and the maintenance phase. And so this is just individuals who start to use drugs, whether it's the first time or, or they're regularly using drugs, there's multiple different factors that go into whether or not somebody becomes addicted, but obviously you have to first start, right? Uh, individuals who uh, have become addicted or dependent upon a substance um, can also then experience this phase two, which is withdrawal upon cessation. So if they stop using or, or they make an abstinence attempt, is that then they experience various different withdrawal symptoms, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, a third phase is vulnerability to relapse. So individuals that have gone through basically these other phases of regular use and binge using, then have been able to stop and are in a withdrawal period, um, they're considered to be in recovery, uh, and those individuals are then vulnerable to relapse, and, and oftentimes there's some trigger that can bring them back, it's something that will, will they'll start using again based on usually some negative event, 
um, that, that they then relapse back into using and whether or not they continue or not is, again, there's multiple factors that go along with that. But with respect to resistance exercise and exercise in general, really we have withdrawal upon cessation or, or sort of the second phase, uh, as well as the third phase that we could really target. And so let me explain a little bit more about that. The hypothesized mechanisms that we that I have targeted with this is, is to first look at cravings. So individuals who haven't used uh, are going to have a craving to use or the desire to use. And so the major, again, the majority of research in this area has been with exercise and uh, aerobic activity and smoking. And so a lot of studies have shown this pre to post effect of that individuals who haven't smoked but then they exercise and it can be even for a, a very short period of time, just walking on a treadmill, um, then have a reduction in their cravings. And, and this is really the, str the strongest evidence for this is with smoking uh, and very few other studies have been able to show it with other drugs, but nonetheless, it's something that might, that might be tar that could be targeted uh, and useful. The other issue is mood and energy. So as I spoke about withdrawal symptoms just previously, is in, an individual that's in the withdrawal phase, they do have these feelings of negative affect and stress and tension and tiredness. And so obviously we know that with exercises, that exercise can reduce those feelings, can give you sen a sense of energy and vigor, that it can reduce stress. Uh, and so that's something that can be targeted, particularly during that phase, that withdrawal phase. And these are, these are the acronyms that are often given to individuals in recovery or, or seeking treatment is that you have these different triggers. So whether you're bored, anxious, or tired, um, or you have the hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or the hangry, right? As those individuals, these are the triggers. These are the things that bring people to use because they're experiencing these negative states. And so exercise can be particularly helpful with a number of these different things. A third issue we have here, third mechanism, would be looking at cognition and behavior. And so exercise, for sure, depending on the, uh, the intensity of it, can bring somebody's attention away from their, you know, if they're thinking about drug use or, or, or how, to, how to find drugs or whatever it might be, but if you have them exercise, is that it brings their, their attention to their physical sensations, their somatic sensations that they're feeling, their heart rate, their, their breath. And so that's something that can actually, you know, jolt the person into really moving their attention physically into something else. And then with respect to behaviors, that exercise is certainly incongruent with drug use or heavy drug use, it's a matter of that individual, say, for drinking, you're experiencing a hangover, you're certainly not gonna get up and, and go running or it would make it more difficult. So if you're engaged in a regular exercise program, then you may be less likely to use drugs or at least use them in the same intensity. Finally, uh, individuals who, who do have problems with substance use, excuse me, they, they have different barriers to treatment. So there's a clear stigma about individuals who use drugs and it's and that can prevent people from seeking out treatment there's of course a, an access problem and a, and a cost problem and so exercise is something that then could be maybe more practical for individuals it's something they can do on their own uh, it's it's much more convenient it certainly can be low cost and so when we think about the different mechanisms how we can use exercise to help individuals with substance use these are at least the ones that I've targeted or at least tried to study and so we did this small pilot study called the Alcohol Cravings and Exercise Study to look at how resistance exercise, just a short bout of a practical bout of, of resistance exercise could be helpful for people who were heavy drinkers. And we targeted young adults um, just because it's the comorbidity of various different diseases of older adults increases the risk for them to have an event while exercising. And we really just wanted to take a look at this and target certain mechanisms and see, could, could we just suggest that somebody engage in a short bout of resistance exercise to help them uh, at least stave off some kind of withdrawal symptoms. So these are the questions that we initially used for the screening. And so just to give you a sense of how we find somebody who, who potentially has a alcohol use problem, uh, we use the alcohol use disorders identification test or the audit. And these are the three main questions that center around dependence. And so they, they are really over the last month uh, have you found that you were not able to stop drinking once you started? So that's sort of com compulsory drinking that it's out of your control. Two, how often during the last month have you failed to do what was normally expected of you because of the drinking? And so with that is it's targeting that you you it's getting in the way of your normal activities of daily living, that you're failing to meet your responsibilities because you're busy using, that there's significant harm coming in your life 
uh, because of your drinking and your using. And then the third one here is, is how often during the last month have you needed a first drink in the morning to get you get yourself going after a heavy drinking session? And that's really a, a, a getting at tolerance as well as uh, dependence on the substance. That there's a withdrawal that there's a withdrawal period after use, and the only way that you can re reduce that withdrawal period is to have the drug back in your system. So we use these three questions. Uh, individuals, anyone that's familiar with the audit, uh, it's a 10 question test and uh, we required every individual to score at least 20 or higher so that we knew that they would have some significance with respect to their dependence. The way that the study was designed is it was within subjects, so each individual came in twice and they were randomly assigned, assigned it was counterbalanced, they were randomly assigned to either the resistance exercise session first or a control condition first. Both were 20 minutes. Uh, in the resistance exercise, they did 10 two-minute rounds of squats, push-ups, and lunges. Uh, they did around 10, uh, sorry, 12 to 15 repetitions uh, for each of those different sets. In the control uh, session, they came in and they watched an educational video. They just sat in a comfortable chair. There was a researcher there uh, to just ensure that they weren't looking at their phone or they weren't distracted. They were actually paying attention to the video. And so then we have these two different sessions that we were able to compare across these individuals. To look at the study design, uh, just in the assessments, at the baseline, individuals came in, we asked them to abstain from alcohol for 18 hours. It was a self-report. We didn't have uh, a measure that could get at that past 18 hours. What we did, though, is we measured their breath alcohol content when they came in, so that needed to be zero. Uh, then we assessed their alcohol cravings, so that was just a, an eight-item scale. And then we looked at affect and arousal, and so affect was measured with the feeling scale which is a negative five to a positive five, one item scale, where it is that the negative five is that you feel terrible and it's the worst that you felt. Positive five is the best that you felt. Arousal, we measured that with the felt arousal scale. And that is a scale of one to six, again, a single item. And that is low arousal, I mean, low, low energy, low vigor, compared to highs, number six, which would be high arousal and that the person uh, basically, you know, has this, 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 feeling of excitement or that they can physically feel um, excited. So we took the baseline, uh, the baseline measure, then we did it at 10 minutes, the mid session, and then we did it immediately post exercise. Then we had a 10 minute delay period. Uh, so the total session was 30 minutes overall. And again, this was for young adults. So they were 18 to 40 years old. Uh, and let me show you the results here. We had 203 people that we screened. 56 were eligible. We had 22 come in at least for the first session and then 14 completed both sessions. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the lecture. We had individuals, the majority were male. So they're about 64% of them were male. They were 31.6. Majority were black or identified as black or African-American. Then we, the majority had only reached high school level with their education or less. Uh, and then about a little more than a third had another substance use dependence that they reported. And so here are the results for the craving. We really didn't see any changes from the pre to post to then the delay period. There were no differences uh, either in either condition or comparing the conditions. We did see a difference though when you look at the feeling scale. So individuals in the resistance exercise condition felt better at the delay when you compared it to the pre, when we're comparing to the control uh, who had sort of went sort of went down. Uh, and then felt arousal also increased and the resistance exercise uh, came back down to baseline at the delay. But the overall conclusions that we took from this was just with a 20 minute bout of resistance exercise for individuals who have a alcohol dependence and, and they have at least self-reported that they haven't drank over the past 18 hours that, that they might have some changes in their cravings. Uh, it might go down, uh, but there might not be this, you, resistance training might not be necessary. There might've been just the effect of the intervention there. Uh, we did see improved affect and increased energy though. So this idea that if, if we can use resistance exercise to combat could that withdrawal symptoms, that those negative feelings of affect and that decreased energy, um, then it is something that could potentially be used uh, to get through that withdrawal period and, and sort of move the person hopefully into recovery. So the next steps of, with this area of research is I'd like to conduct an intervention 
It would need objective indicators of drinking, as a lot of this was just self-report. Uh, and then I would want to look at certainly more biological and psychological outcomes. Again, this was just a really practical study, a one-time uh, 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 session to look at and see you know, what happens with individuals to get at those different mechanisms. Uh, overall, hang on here. Sorry, not sure what happened. Okay. Okay, and I don't know if you can see. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, okay, sorry. Not sure what happened. So what I was trying to get at, here's the conceptual model that I came up with. So if you follow with me from the left to the right, an individual makes a quit attempt and, or an abstinence, an abstinence attempt. And so that, that person experiences withdrawal symptoms, craving, sleep disturbance. If we can get them to, to engage in resistance exercise, then we can re reduce those withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and then we also, which I'll talk about in the future, we may see these changes for self-efficacy for abstinence. So overall, a longer period of time is there might be sort of this mastery experience and, and these uh, accomplishments that might have happened that help the, the individual believe that they're able to then maintain abstinence. Um, they've gone through various different challenges and they then have perceived their ability to do that a little bit differently. So that ultimately then uh, ends with reduced use. If we have reduced use, then we can have a reduction in disease risk. If you look at that box that's in the middle there, we know that resistance exercise and regular resistance exercise can give you an improved metabolic profile increase your physical fitness, reduce your body fat, reduce sy systemic inflammation. And so those things, of course, are related to a reduction in disease risk. And so this is the bigger picture and understanding and bringing it back to that, the first slides that I was showing you, I was showing you about disease risk. Uh, and disease this is a matter of that if we can help individuals uh, stay away from using that we can and, and engage in exercise, then certainly we can um, help reduce the overall disease risk. So I was able to sort of get at this model with this R01 that I, that I received uh, several years ago. Uh, the name of the study is called Strength to Quit, and this study was using resistance exercise to help people quit smoking. Uh, the way that this worked is that individuals were randomized into a 12-week intervention of resistance training or contact control and attention control condition. We took acute assessments, number two there, each week, we looked at cravings and withdrawal symptoms. We looked at affect and arousal, measured it the same way. And we also measured salivary cortisol. So cortisol here is, um, was measured because smokers have high levels of cortisol. Really, it's a result of a constant intake of nicotine, which increases levels of cortisol. When they quit smoking, nicotine drops in their system and the cortisol drops. Uh, the slope at which it drops, so how dramatically it drops in their system, uh, seems to predict is related to their withdrawal symptoms. And so the idea was is that if they could engage in a, a regularly vigorous bout of, of resistance exercise, or at least moderate to high intensity, that it would increase cortisol. And with that increase in cortisol, we could potentially buffer the drop in cortisol, reduce the, the dramatic slope that might happen for some. And if we could do that, then we could re reduce the withdrawal symptoms. And so by doing that, we might help to have the person um, stay in the, in to move them into recovery. Uh, the end of the intervention, we did what's called seven day PPA or point prevalence abstinence, which is the standard measure for smoking. And so that is whether or not an individual has had even a puff of a cigarette over the past seven days. And that's a self-report measure. Uh, the way that we measured it is we have the self-report measure, but then we also have a carbon monoxide machine, which can measure somebody's uh, breath carbon monoxide. So that can tell us whether or not somebody has smoked within the past five or six hours. Uh, finally, the, object, the main objective measure was salivary cotinine. So cotinine is a derivative of nicotine uh, that, that is in your system for up to seven days after you've used nicotine. So we took salivary, we took a salivary sample from uh, spit from everybody, um, and then we'll analyze that and look at what the, the amount of cotinine that's in their, sal in their saliva, 
And then that really is the objective measure of whether or not they have had any nicotine in their system over the past seven days. So we don't rely on self-report. We instead rely on this more objective biological measure of whether or not they've smoked. So that's the end of the intervention. That's the three month after the 12 weeks. And then we have them come back six months later and then 12, at the 12 month point to do a follow up. Uh, the one thing with this is that at the end of the intervention, those in the resistance exercise group received a nine month gym membership. And so that was to support their ability to keep lifting weights and continue to exercise during that nine month period to help them, again, maintain uh, their quit smoking if they did or to help them keep going and, and keep trying, basically. Uh, so that's overall the map of the intervention. Um, with respect to the different conditions is that in the resistance training condition, we had uh, every individual got a 20 minute cessation education uh, prior prior to being randomized. We did that with everybody. So you can see in both conditions in the resistance training and the contact control, everybody uh, went through this. Uh, basically, we teach them issues of, uh, you know, get rid of your cigarettes, clear your environment, tell all your friends, do all these various different uh, uh, behavioral factors to, to help yourself stay away from cigarettes and not keep smoking. Um, so everybody got that. They also got the nicotine patch. We explained how to use it if they wanted it. Not everybody took it, but we offered it to everybody and they could have that for up to 10 weeks. Each of the conditions had two sessions per week. They were 45 to 60 minutes per session. The resistance training program was full body uh, and in progressive. Progressively got more intense. Uh, the, health, the contact control just did health education topics. It was mainly a video based um, uh, control group where they just came in and watched the video and it was really to just control for the amount of time and contact. Uh, with respect to the measures, we certainly looked at, at, at nicotine dependence, um, depression, we looked at nutrition, um, other substance dependence. We also measured their uh, fitness, body composition, try to get all these various different things, um, including systemic inflammation. Uh, we'll look at IL-6 for that. And that's really to get at, yeah, I'm not sure why this keeps kicking out, I'm sorry. Okay, we really, sorry about this. Okay. Tried to target all these different risk factors. So we measured, uh, we looked at their diet. Well, of course, we have tobacco use. We measured uh, blood pressure. We have all the, their uh, um, height and weight and, and body composition. Uh, we looked at uh, HbA1c, so we will be able to tell um, their blood glucose control. We have blood lipids, so we'll be able to look at their cholesterol. Um, and like I said, we'll, we look at other drug use. So we really tried to target all these various different risk factors to look at how does resistance exercise change any of these? Will it help? How did it change over a period of time with respect to whether or not they quit? Um, overall, we screened almost 6,000 people, uh, and that's not a typo. We did a lot of screening with individuals in New York City. Uh, we had about 1,200 who were eligible, and then uh, 500 consented actually came in. Uh, to get past the assessments, we ultimately only randomized 180. Uh, it took a lot of work, though, as you can imagine. Uh, and so there were 90 in each group. Uh, it worked out to be completely even. And then similar to uh, the alcohol study, the majority of these individuals were men. They were middle-aged, around 50 years old. The majority identified as black or African-American. Uh, the majority had only a high school education. A majority were unemployed. And uh, uh, large, uh, about a third of them had another substance use uh, dependence. So that's really what individuals look like. Now here's the results. I only, I hope this is not anticlimactic because I only have the um, the smoking results for the the initial intervention. I don't have the six or twelve month results yet. But as you can see, the resistance training is in blue and the control group is in red. And so on the left there, you have the seven day point prevalence abstinence. Those are not different between the two groups. And again, this is at the end of treatment, at the end of the 12 weeks. Uh, but there was this large difference between them. The odds ratio is 1.9. So really what this tells me is, is that we just didn't have enough power, even with 90 people in each group.
group, um, you know, it's it's almost a double rate here of the resistance exercise versus the control. So individuals were more likely to be able to achieve that seven, maybe more likely to achieve that seven day point prevalence abstinence in the resistance training group. Nonetheless, if we looked at their 24 hour abstinence, so those individuals who hadn't smoked a cigarette within the past 24 hours, there was a significant difference between the two groups. Um, if we move to the next slide here, you can see that uh, the baseline level of cigarette smoked, so individuals on average smoked almost a pack a day in both groups. And then we got both of those groups to come down to just a couple cigarettes a day. Now, these, this is significantly different between the group, two groups where the resistance exercise group um, smoked significantly less. Not, but, but I think that this is still something that's helpful. If we can move, uh, regardless of the intervention, if we can move individuals from almost a pack a day down to just a couple, um, then that will be really important. Now, some qualifiers with this is that, again, this is just the seven day PPA. And so we don't have the salivary cotinine. So I don't have that to be able to verify the changes in all of these and whether or not individuals had actually had nicotine in their system. Um, and so we have several more analyses to do with this. And so this really is, is just the preliminary differences. Um, nonetheless, to me, I think it's a very positive result and hopefully it will stay this way. Um, we're on the same trend or it will get better. Um, the idea that that resistance training did did ultimately work. Uh, if not, um, I view this as a harm reduction in, in this idea that if we can just get individuals to, to reduce the number of cigarettes and we're reducing the amount of harm that they're doing to their bodies. Uh, going forward, however, I know that there are some key limitations with the study. And so one of them is, is that we didn't provide any major behavioral support for their exercise adherence. Uh, we generally had pretty good adherence it was twice a week for 12 weeks, so it was 18, we, sorry, it should have been uh, 24 sessions per person, but we averaged around 18 sessions over that 12 weeks. Um, so generally pretty good. Uh, smokers are hard to work with. And so I feel confident that we, that we generally got at this, but the dose of exercise that they got certainly could have been better. And so in the future, I'd like to do some kind of behavioral support to have individuals be more adherent to exercise. And as well as exercise outside of the fact that they're with us, this idea of bringing back to the ACE study that you can do single bouts of exercise when you're when you're going when you're feeling bad, right? When you have the hangry, when you're hangry, is that instead of those triggers, you can try to exercise instead to to sort of reduce those those feelings. The second thing that we didn't measure, which I wish we did, and I think that there is something to this, is mastery experiences and accomplishment. So again, individuals who were able to um, do really well with their resistance training and they push themselves and they had personal goals that they met. Um, I believe that that is something that could possibly help them is just that giving them this experience of, of increasing self-efficacy for being uh, an accomplished person or somebody that can reach their goals certainly can be helpful. And then finally, addiction is a, a disease of the brain. And so it would be a matter of looking at a lot of different neurological changes, whether physiological changes that I can't measure and have to partner with somebody um, or other uh, just small changes that could be, whether it's attention um, or you know, response time, those things, I think that the, the addiction alters um, and something that maybe could be altered by exercise. So finally, just to wrap this up, I just wanted to uh, thank past students and current students because I certainly couldn't have done any of this research without these individuals. Um, and with that, I'll just say thanks for your attention. Great, thank you, Joe. That was a great presentation. I'm gonna encourage everyone who's listening remotely to go ahead and enter any questions you might have into the, the question box. I know we'll have some questions here in the national office. We have several staff um, watching the webinar today. I'll, I'll get us started. Um, can you give us some sense of why you thought resistance training um, might be beneficial? So you said a lot of the research had been done with aerobic exercise. Did you feel like most of the questions have been answered there or that resistance training might appeal to a different group of individuals. What led you down that path? Yeah, right, sure. So uh, a couple things. One is, yes, uh, it's, it's just resistance training is, is untapped with this area. Really, the stuff that I have done um, has been the only that I've been able to find. Um, there have been a couple studies that have used combined exercise. Um, but nobody has really just focused on resistance training. Uh, and, and so the reason why I wanted to do that, one is because um, 
the majority of individuals who have, so men use drugs more than women. Um, and almost any drug that you, that you can name. Uh, with prescription pills, women tend to, to, to be more equal to men, but with cigarettes, with alcohol, with uh, uh, marijuana, with heroin, cocaine, men use more. Um, and so to me, if you're going to offer exercise as a, um, as a means to help somebody deal with their addictions, then you want to offer an exercise that's something that, that that individual wants to do. Now, I'm not saying that women don't like to lift weights, but men typically like to lift weights and they typically report wanting to lift weights more than other types of exercise. So I think that it can get it at that. It can be a type of exercise that is immediately appealing. Uh, a second reason is, is that uh, just with respect to, to the various different drugs, if we look at nicotine, again, I tried to explain a little bit about the cortisol, is, is that if there is an intensity factor, then resistance exercise intensity uh, can, can be very intense in a short period of time versus uh, uh, we have your single sessions, right, or your, your single um, sets. And so one set can be very intense, and then you rest, and then you do another set, and then you rest, and then you do another set. Now, uh, with respect to high intensity interval training, we recently got into that with aerobic activity where people are running sprints um, and we're seeing all the benefits from that. But the nature of resistance exercise is high intensity intervals. And so it's a matter of that if we can push somebody to have a really intense bout, but then rest and then push them to have another intense bout and rest, it's the nature of the, of the exercise. So it seems to, it sort of falls along with if there's a, an important piece of intensity is that it, it works, sets up nicely. Okay. Not that, re not that aerobic activity does not, but resistance training certainly does. Another issue is, is that it can be oftentimes much more practical. So with our alcohol study, again, it was just no equipment. The individual just had to do uh, squats and lunges and push-ups. Um, and those might not be individual's favorite exercises to do, but it is something that you can do with, if it's a rain, you know, if it's a rainy day, then you can't necessarily go out running. If you don't have a treadmill, then you can't go out running. If you're able to just do something uh, that's much more practical without any equipment, then, then maybe that's very appealing. And so there are some other reasons, but I'll stop there with sort of my top three. Great, thanks. So this is a question that came in from someone watching rem remotely. How long after exercise do the subjects um, report to that the cravings start back again yeah so so you probably about an hour i would say i haven't when we haven't really been able to test we haven't gone out say several hours to look at it or we haven't looked at and and that is something that is the future of this research ideally it would be with text messaging it would be that we could assess somebody continually assess them and ask them how they feel after their bout of exercise um, it certainly comes down, it seems to come down during exercise. And again, I think that that's really dependent on the intensity of the exercise that's being done. Um, but then we'll start to creep back up. And then there are other issues that come into that, the variance of, you know, when was the last time the individual used, uh, where they are within their stage of addiction and how addicted they are, uh, you know, how intense their withdrawal feelings are, whether it's been, you know, is it the first day or is it the third day that they haven't used? So where are their cravings? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. It certainly, exercise might be something that could be helpful, but uh, I'm not sure it's the, the exact correct answer. It's just a component. Great, okay, there was another question. Um, there, this person was wondering if your research subjects were folks who had previously been exercising or were these effects mostly in um, individuals who were new to exercise? These are all great questions. These are all new exercisers. So anybody that was regularly exercising was not included in that. The point of that was to look at exercises, the new stimulus. Great. Okay. Here's another one. Were individuals in the, in your studies aware of the extent of their substance abuse problem? Had they reached a point that they wanted to pursue help with their addiction? The, the majority reported that they, uh, wanted to quit and there the you know there's a continuum of wanting to quit of where you are with I'm ready to quit right now um, I'm ready to be done with it right now or I want to quit soon uh, the majority wanted to quit now uh, with respect to um, their other substance use so again about a third of the of the individuals had another substance use problem um, 
you know, this population is really doesn't have a lot of access to care. They don't have a lot of access to to health. Uh, have they don't have health insurance? They don't have the ability to just go and see somebody for help. And so, with respect to how they think about their own addiction or where they think they are with with respect to their disease, I'm not sure. We didn't ask them, but um, I mean, it's a these individuals have tough lives. Um, and, and so it's, uh, they really are more catering to what it is that they need to do that day. Um, I'm really surprised that we got as much the high as high adherence as we did because so many individuals were just dealing with daily challenges of just trying to pay their rent. Um, they weren't necessarily so concerned about, um, you know, other things in their life that, that maybe would seem less impactful. Okay, we have another question. Um, someone was wondering about your recruitment. Um, you were able to recruit and screen a lot of individuals. Uh, what sort of methods did you use um, for recruiting participants to your studies? Sure. Uh, we predominantly got individuals through uh, uh, a free newspaper that's in the New York City subway called AM New York. And so we advertise in that. Um, but we did, as, we did as much as we possibly could. Uh, we contacted we hung flyers. We contacted uh, various different uh, either treatment centers, hospitals. Um, we went all over the city to really try to find as many people as we possibly could. So the phone rang, uh, but not everybody was eligible. A lot. The two main reasons why people weren't eligible, one is that they had some illness that prevented them from it being safe. So if they had active uh, pulmonary disease like like COPD or the emphysema, we did not take them. Um, that was one of the exclusions. If they had active or if they knew that they had cardiovascular disease, they had had a heart attack, uh, we did not take them. So we took individuals, pretty much everything else with respect to uh, outside of that or somebody who currently had cancer. Um, so that was the main thing is medical issues is what excluded individuals. And then the second thing was that people were active. This is that this is New York City and so people walk um, and there's a lot of transportation activity um, sometimes that was hard for us to figure out whether it was planned activity versus transportation. Um, but a lot of times people reported they were physically active and so we didn't include them. Great. Um, so for the subjects that had multiple addictions, um, did any of them state that exercise helped more with curbing the cravings for one addiction as compared to another? Did you get any sort of information on that? Uh, quitting smoking is hard. And individuals have, we had numerous individuals who had stopped using crack, cocaine, um, other types of drugs that are generally considered more serious, is that individuals have a really hard time quitting smoking. Um, nicotine is incredibly addictive um, and it may not have the negative social consequences that a lot of other drugs have. Uh, certainly it has, a, it has a lot of negative health consequences and so, um, People and it's and it's expensive. This is another issue. This is that people really like couldn't stop smoking and they, and they needed to spend their money on cigarettes when they really didn't need to spend their money on something else. Great. Okay. Um, so someone is asking though, body weight exercises are more convenient. Do you think heavy weight lifting could be more beneficial as a mood stimulant, especially for male users? I think that's a great question and a testable question. Um, but it, you know, bought with body weight, it might, depending on the fitness level of the individual, body weight might not be able to do it, but it, it, it intensity seems to be um, a key factor. And so if it's about intensity, however you can get at that intensity, whether it's with body weight, because perhaps you're not used to body weight exercises. And so it's particularly challenging, or if you, you know, or you're more advanced, if you need to jump, you know, step up your training a notch um, and you need to use heavier weights, then that might do it. With respect to um, intensity and changes in mood, um, certainly with aerobic activity, it's been shown that individuals who have very high, who work out very high intensity will have a negative response. Although there's a, there is some variability with that where individuals who are certainly very fit have a positive response, but um, yeah, just like with any outcome, exercise intensity really seems to be very important. Great. Okay, somebody else is asking, 
uh, let's see, addiction transfer is a concern in recovery programs, specifically 12-step programs. Participants are often discouraged from taking on a resistance training program. What guidelines would you recommend um, so that someone might be able to start a program and maximize the benefits of exercise to recovery? Yeah, I don't, I don't know why that is. The, well, well, all right, so two things. One of the, the rolling addictions or moving one to another. Um, you know, overall, I think that, that addiction is, is certainly growing in its, um, in the scientific li literature with respect to treatment, that, that the changes in how we treat individuals now is much different than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and, and part of that is, is, the, is the social stigma around it. And so um, I would say that, you know, we don't have a good understanding of what exercise can do as part of a, as part of a treatment program. There isn't a lot of information about it. Like I said, this is that the most information we have is around smoking. And typically in a treatment program, smoking is kind of the last thing that's worked on. And so, you know, there, there are other drugs that, that, that seem to be more important. Um, and so I would say, I don't know that the literature is set on that and that, that the guidelines are really based on a, a solid, uh, you know, unequivocal literature base. I would say that we have a lot of work to do and need to figure that out. Great, okay, we're gonna take one last question um, and finish up the webinar. You may have touched on this a little bit earlier, but do you expect that similar neural pathways would be affected by resistance training? Um, as as to those that have been shown to be altered with aerobic training. Yeah. So, all right. There is a uh, uh, a couple of researchers that are looking at this with respect to preclinical studies and looking at, at rat models. Um, and I'm uh, I'm not a neurophysiologist and I or a neuroscientist, so I cannot speak to the specifics of that. But I can tell you that uh, with respect to the rat models, there are a couple studies that look at resistance exercise. Um, and there are differences between aerobic activity. So for a rat, it is differences of running on a wheel or a treadmill versus typically they either have rats put on a weighted vest and have them climb a ladder or they tie a weight to their tail, which is a little bit you know, less nice. And, and that is how they do resistance exercise in rats. But rats, you can cut their brain out and look at changes in, say, mRNA activity and, and, and differences in dopamine. Um, and so... Uh, how that plays out in humans is not entirely clear because we can't cut people's brains out, but um, I would say stay tuned. I don't want to give any recommendations of the clear differences, but you know, regardless whether it's aerobic activity or resistance exercise, if there can be this some change, then that would be great. Um, if there, you know, there's certainly combined activity that would be helpful. It's a matter of just really figuring these things out because we're so at the very beginning of this, it's not, it's not clear. Um, the different factors that would affect uh, all these different outcomes. All right. With that, we're going to end our webinar. Everyone here in the National Office is going to um, thank Joe for his time. I'm sure everyone remotely is is doing the same. So whatever applause you hear, Joe, just imagine it's uh, amplified exponentially. Um, yeah. But thank you for your time today. And uh, with that, we'll end our webinar. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.